Your Coca-Cola bottler presents Claudia, based on the famous play and novels by Rose Franken. Brought to you transcribed Monday through Friday by your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. Relax, and while you're listening, refresh yourself. Have a Coke. And now, Claudia. Uh, David, Claudia, what are you two doing sitting around the office? It's after five o'clock. And what are you doing coming back to the office so late, Roger? Because I'm absent-minded. Because I forgot my pills in my desk drawer, and I'm going to a dinner party, and you know the food at dinner parties. Oh. I shall die in ulcerous agony if I am not equipped with all my pills. Oh, dear. <laughs> the before meal and the after meal. <laughs> now, does that answer your question? Yes, rather explicitly, too, I'd say. Uh, just what are you two doing here? You seem rather well settled. David with his feet on his desk, Claudia just looking, well, rather well settled. We're waiting. Oh, mm -hmm. fascinating pastime. I suppose you even want to know what we're waiting for. Is it a what? Nope, it's a who. Jared Tucker is the who. Jared Tucker? Mm -hmm. The old man of the mountain from whom you bought the farm? The very same. <laughs> Why the chuckle? <laughs> Roger, it's rude to laugh by yourself. <laughs> Well, at least tell us why so we can laugh with you. <laughs> the picture of that toothless old man wandering around New York in his jeans. He was wearing his city suit, and he looked very respectable. Spit in tobacco at the lamppost, muttering away to himself. <laughs> I can't imagine what a surprise he must be to the other pedestrians. <laughs> well, you're not laughing. Any other day, maybe. Something wrong with the old man? We don't know. Oh, now, look, just because he's late doesn't mean he's been hit by a taxi or anything like that. That's not what we're thinking, Roger. We drove Mr. Tucker into town this morning. He was to meet us here at 5.15. And in between? Well, all we know is that yesterday, after we brought the cow home and got her settled, he asked if he could hitch a ride into town with us. Then he muttered something about a hospital. Oh, well, maybe he was going to visit someone. No, I don't think so. Why not? Well, I just don't. Mr. Tucker never would have mentioned the hospital at all if it was that he was going to do something nice for someone else. You're sure? Yes, I've never known a man who goes to more trouble to seem tough. When inside, he's as soft and sweet as a marshmallow. And you love marshmallows. <laughs> yeah, Tucker's a funny old man, and Claudia's right about him. You know, he went to the hospital about himself. And, well, frankly, I wish he were here now. You're a wondrous couple. All worked up over an old man who's already long outlived himself. What is he, 90? He says he's 86. 86. And no responsibility of yours whatsoever. But he is, in a way. He's our neighbor. Claudia's turned out to be a real Yankee, hasn't she, David? More of a Yankee than a Yankee, Roger. She drives a mighty tight bargain. Being a Yankee has nothing to do with that. It's being a woman. And their knocking, I believe, is the original Yankee. Come in, Mr. Tucker. I thought you might have given up waiting for me by now. Not a chance, Mr. Tucker. I was uh, kind of delayed. Them underground railroad trains took me traveling where I had no business going. You, uh, you got on the wrong train, did you? Never could find the right one. Ended up a doing it by leg. Shanks mare, as they say. I can get myself around better than any god darned underground rings of muck of locomocution. Yep, I can. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Tucker. You're the partner of Mr. Norton, ain't you? Roger Killian is the name. Yep, we met before. I wasn't sure you remembered. Oh, I ain't losing my memory. I might be losing some other things. Yep, I might even have lost them already, but I ain't losing my memory. We were worried about you, Mr. Tucker. Uh, you got plenty of right to be, Mrs. Norton. We have. I've been fighting with this city all day. How any sensible man stays alive in this here hornet's nest is more than I can see. Cars on the street, stopping, going, turning, trains over your head, trains under your feet, people pushing, pulling... Ain't fitting surrounding even for even for a human being today. Oh, we agree. That's why we moved to Eastbrook. Round about noon, I got a hankering to see a speck of sky, so I stood still where I was and looked up. Near broke my neck craning around the tops of the buildings to catch a peak of the blue. Darn near got myself killed too. <laughs> got walked into by eight people. Almost started to panic. <laughs> Folks was wondering what I was staring at. When I told them it wasn't nothing but a speck of sky, I practically ended up being drug off to the nearest booby hatch. <laughs> no, nope, you wouldn't catch me dead living here, you wouldn't. I dare say we wouldn't catch you dead living anywhere, Mr. Tucker. Yeah, it's quite a day, quite a day. Well, is that all that happened to you? Oh, not by a long shot. What else? What else I'm keeping to myself. Some things is personal. Oh. Yep. Some things a man prefers not to talk about. Well, a man should be able to talk about anything to his friends. Says who? 
I talk about what I talk about. That's all. Yep, that's me. So, uh, this here office is where you architect, eh, son? Yeah, this is it. Yeah, pretty high up. I near lost me ears in that elevator coming up, but I don't blame you. You don't blame David for what? Being pretty high up is about the only safe place in this here city. <laughs> Down below, you got the cars, the automobiles, and the pigeons to worry about. <laughs> Up here, only them airplanes and them elevators. <laughs> you know, I don't blame the Indians for selling this here island of Manhattan for $24. That's all it's worth, son. It's all it's worth. <laughs> you, uh, you don't come into town often, do you? Only for emergencies. Medical kind, more often than not. But folks get to my age, we got to expect a mighty trouble. Farmers, architects, you're all one when you're dead. Dead? Yep. Yeah. Even I'm going to die someday, they tell me. Yep, even Jared Tucker. Well, it's difficult for each of us to believe in our own mortality. The most difficult thing of all. Yeah, especially when you've lived as long as I have. Say, uh, son, there's a this phone call I'm just itching to make. Why didn't you say so? There's a phone. Well, if you'd let me finish, you wouldn't be so quick to hand me the phone. It's a long-distance call. All the better. I still don't understand. Won't cost you just a nickel. It's long distance to Eastbrook. To Eastbrook? Is that all? <laughs> we don't call Eastbrook long distance. That's where we live. Oh, you get into New York, Mrs. Norton. You're just as nutty as the rest of us. <laughs> but I warned you, I ain't calling just around the corner now. Mr. Tucker, why don't you use the phone at the outside desk? We'll be more comfortable, more private. Oh, I ain't got nothing to hide. Much. I'm just calling Delilah. Give your sister my regards? Yes, I will. And she'll send them right back with her name attached. Silly business. <laughs> You're uh, sure now you don't mind about this call? No, eh? we're we're flattered to have you use our phone, Mr. Yeah. Tucker. Hogwash, put your plight. Hello? Give me East Book 714 Ring 2. And, and get it to me quick, here. Eh? Doesn't look so good, does it? Talking about death an awful lot. You don't think that he... Oh, no, he couldn't be... He could be, yes. Is he always so irascible? He's mellow today, Roger. That's why we're concerned. Hello? Delilah? She's younger than he is, and he treats her as if she were a hundred. Yep, I'm still in the city. Terrible place, too. No place for a woman. No. It's not rude to eavesdrop when it's for a purpose, is it, David? It's always rude. Poor old Tucker. Uh, Delilah, I'm calling you about supper. So hush up and listen to me. Seems to me, like I said, I thought I'd be able to manage this steak this evening, didn't I? Steak? You can't be very sick. Can you hear me? Well, forget it. No steak. Oh. And them french fried potatoes, forget them too. I want you to make me a dish of milk toast instead. Goes down nice and easy like. Milk toast and soft boiled eggs for dinner. Supper. Delilah and the eggs are very soft. Get it? Mm. Hey? Milk toast and very soft eggs. Sounds bad. Mm. It's his stomach. I'm intimate with milk toast and very soft-boiled eggs, too. Yes. Yes, that uh, medico says I was a pretty hopeless case. Nothing more he could do for me but let me go. Yes. Yes, dang them all. Hopeless case. Oh, David, it's awful. Them doctors ain't good for much when it's something important. Well, yes, guess might as well face it, Delilah. I ain't as young as I was. I ain't yet old, but I ain't as young as I was. Eh, well, take good care of yourself and feed the pigs. I'll be home in a bit. David, you talk to him, man to man. Roger and I'll just step into the other office. That's right, David. Maybe we can help you. He's a tough customer, but I'll do my best. Come on, this way, Claudia. Are you ready now, Mr. Tucker? Yep, son, I'm ready. Mr. Tucker, I'll, I'll be honest, I... Overheard your conversation with your sister. Oh, it ain't nothing to blush about. I overhears every conversation I can get my ears on to. <laughs> Mr. Tucker, a couple of months ago when I was in a car accident and things were a little tough with us, you came over to the house and offered Claudia help. We'll never forget that. Well, you didn't take my help, so why the pretty speeches? Because now we want to offer you help. Offer me help? There's no use pretending, Mr. Tucker. Please, let us do this. I don't know who your doctor is or what is exactly the matter, but I know some very fine specialists. If there's anything that can be done... You're a right would... nice man, Mr. Norton, and your wife's a right nice woman, but you can't help me that way. Tainted, I'm not, not grateful for the offer, but you can't help me. Why not? 
It's my teeth, son, my teeth. Your teeth? They don't fit. They never will fit and they never can fit. Do you? Do you? Uh, you see these uppers and lowers? Worst set of teeth I ever tried to chew with. <laughs> I can't chew, can't eat. I come into town to get them set straight, but the doctor says, long as I insist on using the store-bought kind, he just can't help me. <laughs> you, you mean... You mean you bought these in a store? Yep, sure did. I wouldn't let a Dr. Hornswoggle me into making them daughter. <laughs> Cost a fortune. And if I can buy my shoes in a store, I can buy my teeth in a store, too. Except they, they just don't fit right. Well, how do your shoes fit? Well, they don't fit right neat. No. But I growed used to them. Growed calluses. These dang teeth. I was better off when I was getting along with only two of them old. At least the way they was one above the other. Well, that made it convenient. These store-bought ones are always falling out. I got to... <laughs> Up and I, I want to talk and just, just leave my mouth open, see? When I eat, son, it's holy murder. They, they're chewing up my gums like a tractor and leaving the food alone. So, so that's why you came into town? I get no satisfaction, none at all, except from knowing that you're my friend. Well, I knew that before, Mr. Tucker. You, you, you must have known it, too. Yes, I did, I did. Dang, Keith, <laughs> keep me from talking as much as I'd like to. <laughs> Claudia, Claudia, come in here. I've got good news for you. Maybe he's going to let us do whatever we can. Why, why the funny look? It's it's not his stomach, and it's not his age. It's his teeth, Don. His teeth? His teeth. They don't quite fit right. Ergo, the milk toast. And soft-boiled eggs. You mean, you mean those beautiful teeth aren't yours, Mr. Tucker? They sure ain't. And I'm proud I ain't related to them. That's a cussing. So, uh, darling... Oh, David, what a relief. It's only his teeth. Only my teeth? She says it's only my teeth. Mrs. Norton, things have gotten so bad that I'm thinking of taking these dang teeth and doing my chewing in the palm of my hand. That's how bad things is. Yep. Toothless Tucker, that's me. No two people work alike. But all people feel better after a refreshing pause during the working day. And that is as true for homemakers as for time clock punchers. The ironing will go smoother, the sauce will turn out better if you relax with a frosty bottle of delicious Coca-Cola and go back to work refreshed. He's quite a character, that old Tucker, isn't he, Mr. King? He certainly is. There aren't many of his ilk left, are there? Personally, uh, Mr. Killian, I feel that folk like Mr. Tucker are like salt and pepper, for instance. Spread around thin, they add flavor to the countryside. A nice flavor. I like it. And I think Eastbrook is a pretty nice place to live. Eastbrook? Yes, it's much like any other small town in this country, I imagine. Folks are born. Folks grow old. There's Christmas, Easter, summer, winter. It's, uh, it's all pretty much the same. Well, I know one thing. Tomorrow is pretty much the same all over, because tomorrow is Armistice Day. You're right, Mr. Killian. A day to be reckoned with. Well, goodbye, Joe. Goodbye. Every day, Monday through Friday, Claudia comes to you transcribed with the best wishes of your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. So listen again tomorrow at the same time. And now this is Joe King saying au revoir. And remember, whoever you are, whatever you do, wherever you may be, when you think of refreshment, think of Coca-Cola. For Coca-Cola makes any pause the pause that refreshes. And ice-cold Coca-Cola is everywhere. This broadcast of Claudia was supervised and directed by William Brown Maloney. And now, here's a word from your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola.